All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Revelation's final messages of hope. We're so glad you could join us today. We're actually going to uh, give you a little introduction to our format. Uh, what we're going to be doing is we're first going to ask that you please keep your microphone on mute uh, during the session. Uh, but there will be chances for you to interact, so don't worry about that. Uh, we're going to just try to give as much time as we can allotted to the speaker. Uh, we only have one hour, so he has a lot to cover in that time. And so we're just going to show, um, give him the, the most of the time that he is available. But uh, in the meantime, uh, there's going to be a chat where you can actually send in questions during the session. So I'll be moderating that and monitoring that. So if you have any questions that you have based on what's been presented, or any other question that's kind of related to that, you can share those questions with me. And the next session, we will take time to answer those questions. And so um, feel free to just uh, send those questions in during the session. I uh, just wanna let you know that also, if you are interested in prophecy, and as you're here, uh, that's why you're here, we do have a free offer that we are uh, going to send out to those who are willing to give us your mailing address so that we know where to send it to. Um, the Daniel and Revelation magazine, it's uh, very exhaustive. It has a lot of information, good information about prophecy, if it's new to you. And so that's gonna be available for you uh, if you send me your mailing address. Uh, tonight, our speaker is gonna be Chase Wilder. So he's gonna be leading out. He and I are gonna tag team uh, during this series. So we're gonna be alternating back and forth. So tonight's my off night. And so I'm going to be wor working behind the scenes while he's up front um, sharing what he's got to share today. And so just want to give you a little heads up of what to expect this coming uh, week. Uh, tonight, we're, our presentation is entitled The Coming One World Superpower. And tomorrow it, at 7 o'clock is going to be Coronavirus, Disasters, and the End of the World. Friday night at the same time. It'll be the mystery of immortality. And Saturday uh, night, it'll be how to have peace on earth. And there'll be other uh, titles and presentations coming up as well, but we didn't want to overwhelm you on our first night. So we'll share those as we go night after night. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to go ahead and turn the time over to Chase Wilder. Thank you, Pastor Choi. And I hope that I'm being heard well. Uh, we again, I want to invite you, uh, you know, welcome you all here today. Um, this is a wonderful occasion. This is joyous. Um, we're glad to be studying the Word of God. The most important thing is to study the Word of God. And when we are living in times like this, you, this is a great opportunity for us to dig deeper and to study the Bible simply because of the fact, one reason is because we have so much time on our hands. We know that we're at home, uh, we're with our families, and the Lord would like us to use this time in order to draw closer to him. And so throughout this meeting, as Pastor uh, Choi already mentioned, we're gonna be digging deeper and deeper and deeper into scripture and into prophecy. And uh, tonight, we're gonna get started, but we can't get into everything tonight. And so that's why we have eight days uh, and we hope that you continue to come each and every night. But tonight we're talking about the coming of a one world superpower, the coming of one world superpower. And this type of message can be startling. It can be uh, mind turning and twisting. And of course, that's why we like to use these catchy titles to grab your attention so that you might want to be drawn in more. But in reality, we know the word of God is attention grabbing enough. And so we know the fact that you're here is because you want to hear the word of God. So we're going to start off with a little prayer so that we can get right started and we won't waste any time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity. We thank you for this privilege. We know the world is getting crazy. We know things that are shaking up in the world, especially amidst this whole coronavirus thing. But Today you have hope for us, and we know in your word you have hope for us. So Lord, help us to find this hope and help us to find meaning in your holy scriptures. Tonight, give us the Holy Spirit as we talk about this 
beautiful and pertinent message in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. We'll be in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter two. And I always usually ask people while I'm preaching, what book do I say? But right now we can't do that <laughs> because we're online and we are all far apart. So wherever you're joining with us, I ask that you would please turn to the book of Daniel. We're in Daniel chapter two, wherever you are, if you have a phone, if you have a Bible, a hard copy, or if you're on your computer, you can pull it up on the screen next to you, Daniel chapter two. And we'll be reading from verse uh, one, starting there. The entire chapter there is beautiful. Of course, we won't read every verse, but we are preaching from this entire chapter. And Daniel chapter two is, is one of, or the entire book of Daniel is what we like to call an apocalyptic book. Uh, it's it's apocalyptic in, in the sense that it is pertaining to what some theologians call or scholars would call the apocalypse. Now, that's a big word, and that word means many things. But in reality, we can simply say Daniel is a prophetic book. It is the prophetic book of the Old Testament, looking forward or looking into the future. That is prophecy. And so when we read Daniel or when Daniel was written from the perspective of Daniel, it was written as a book pointing to events that would take place in the future. Daniel, of course, who lived in uh, before the common era, before the time of Jesus, BC is what we call it. Uh, Daniel living in that time is pointing towards to the future compared to his perspective. Of course, us living after the, the, the death and life of Christ 2,000 years after that, we are looking at the events that Daniel prophesied as history and the present day events. And so when we read Daniel, we, we need to read it with a lens of uh, a historical lens. We need to read it with the lens that these things have either already happened or they are happening today. And in Daniel chapter two, starting in verse one, Daniel is a nice Hebrew Jewish boy and he's been in captivity. The king Nebuchadnezzar, who is king of Babylon, has taken over the land of Judah. And now uh, Daniel, his friends, his family, everything he knows has been stripped away from him. Their culture has been stripped away from them. And now they are placed in captivity. The Bible says in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, who was king of Babylon, his reign as king of Babylon, and not only that, but king of the captivity, a king of the Jews at that time, or not king of the Jews, but king of those Jews who were taken into captivity. The Bible says he had a dream. The Bible says he dreamed dreams, so much so that his spirit was troubled. These were no ordinary dreams. These were no ordinary events that, taken, that were taking place. Of course, we know from Hebrew culture and we know from even Babylonian culture, oftentimes when people had dreams, they thought it meant something. It had significance. Sometimes people would say that they dreamed a dream, so they thought the gods were speaking to them or there was a message that was being conveyed to them. This is not foreign to the Bible. In fact, in the book of Numbers, chapter 12, we read that, that if there be a prophet among you, the Lord will speak to him in a vision or a dream. That's found in Numbers chapter 12, and verse 6, if you want to write that down. He'll speak to them in a vision or dream. So God uses dreams sometimes to communicate to us. Of course, we know this is how he communicates in particular to prophets. But we've read in Romans that God in these days has chosen to communicate to us through his son and through his word. So that doesn't mean every dream you have is going to be a message from God. But it does mean that God does use dreams somehow. And Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. It, it startled him. It, it, it scared him. It frightened him. As the Bible says, his spirit was troubled. And it, break, it broke his sleep. He woke up in the middle of the night terrified at this dream that he had. The issue was, as happens with many of us, when we have dreams, we wake up and we forget the dream. And so all Nebuchadnezzar knows is that he had a dream. It scared him so much that it woke him up, but he couldn't remember. And so Nebuchadnezzar calls together all the, the educated people of his kingdom. He calls the magicians, the Bible says, and the scholars. He called the astrologers and the sorcerers and everyone from the Chaldeans that were on his, in his royal court of, of philosophical and scholastic people. 
And he calls them together and they come, of course, because they follow the order of the king. And they ask, or he asks them, he says, would you please tell me the dream that I had and the interpretation? And the astrologers are sitting there, they're scratching their heads, they're a bit confused because they don't understand how in the world are we supposed to explain to you your dream? How are we supposed to reach into the vast of your mind and, and find the dream that you had in the past, even when you don't even understand? So one of the astrologers, one of the Chaldeans in verse four says, oh, king, your majesty, your royal highness, if you would just tell us the dream, <laughs> maybe then we can explain it to you and give you an interpretation and tell you what it meant. This of course angered the king because you know when the king gives a command it's your responsibility to follow the command no matter how ridiculous it sounds and so the king gets angry and says look listen here you have the responsibility to tell me what i dream and not only that to tell me the interpretation of my dream and if you don't i will kill you there's a death sentence now put on them. And then he says, I'll even uh, cut off your household, your houses, as it says in verse five, shall be made as a dung hill. So Nebuchadnezzar is very serious about this information. Whatever Nebuchadnezzar dreamed, obviously it was important enough to him that he felt necessary to kill for it. This information that we're studying, this prophetic information found in the book of Daniel, found in De Daniel chapter 2, is information worth life. It is information to die for. And if Nebuchadnezzar had this attitude towards this information, we should have this attitude toward it as well. In fact, the Bible says in Amos chapter 3 and verse 12 that surely the Lord will do nothing but he reveals his secrets to the servants, to his servants, the prophets. So if we want to know the secret to, of God, the secret to happiness, the secret to peace, the secret to all the problems in the world today, we need to go to God's revealed statements of prophecy. So here we are in Daniel chapter two, and we have this prophecy. And so back to the story, the Chaldeans and all the magicians and so forth, they're a bit concerned. They have to figure out how they can come up with his dream and his interpretation. Now their lives are at stake. They're in a predicament. They're in a difficult situation. And there's an application that we can learn here, and that is that when we are in difficult situations and trying uh, moments of our lives, we must understand the solution cannot be found in men. The solution cannot be found in our own lives. The solution cannot be found in human wisdom. Oftentimes we come across perplexing things in life like this situation here. And we must recognize that the only way we can find the solution and the answer to the perplexities of life is through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. So the Chaldeans are a bit concerned. They don't know how they're going to tell Nebuchadnezzar his dream. They don't know how they're going to interpret his dream. It doesn't make any sense. It's odd to them. And word gets out to Daniel. Daniel, who is the author of this book, Daniel the prophet, as it says in Daniel chapter one and verse 17, that he had understanding in visions and dreams. Here comes the great man of God. And he hears about the death creed. He says, oh, no, we can't have this happen. We, we, we cannot allow individuals to die because of this dream that the king takes place. So uh, that's when the Lord decided to come and speak to Daniel. In verse 19 of chapter 2, we read that in the night vision, Daniel received the secret. The secret was revealed to him. And then Daniel blessed God. Now, we need to take a minute and pause from this because we need to understand the solution to the problem came from God. And Daniel had the common sense enough to recognize that the, the, the situation that took place was not figured out, or the, the dream itself, the interpretation of the dream was not solved because Daniel was smart, because Daniel was wise, but it was solved because God revealed it to him. And so it is when we think of our lives, when we think of the things we're going through and, and the solution for them, we must understand God has to reveal it to us, how to solve these things. 
In fact, we can understand that God has revealed it to us already, but it's to, in his word. And we need to learn to go to the word of God and to study it more and ask God, how would he have us to live? How would he have us to act? How would he have us to walk? So Daniel has the interpretation. The Lord has revealed it to him. He's excited. He's shouting. He says, oh, King, oh, I mean, oh, God, praise your holy name. Blessed be your name. The God that reveals secrets to us. Oh, praise God. He's excited. And then he makes his way down to the king's palace. Now, the king had given him a different name. The king had stripped him of his identity. The king called him Belteshazzar. So Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, as it says in verse 26, made his way down to the king and he said, and the king asked him, are you able to tell me my dream and the interpretation? And Daniel makes it clear. He says, let me tell you something. I know the magicians were not able to do it. I know the astrologers were not able to do it, but I want you to know I'm not able to do it either, but God is. Verse 28, he says, there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets to men. And he, God in heaven, will make known to you, O King Nebuchadnezzar, what shall be, watch this right here, in the last days. If you have the King James Version, it says in the latter days, the later times. In other words, whatever this dream, whatever this vision, whatever this uh, perplexing uh, dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, whatever it is, whatever is in it, in it is a secret that is important, that is pertinent for those living in the last days. It represents something that will take place throughout Earth's history after the life of Daniel and up until the last days, which are the times we're living in today. He says, you will understand what will take place in the last days. And I, I like this because we don't have to be ignorant about what's going on in the world today. We don't have to speculate. We don't have to guess about all the things that are taking place today because God has already told us what will happen. And if we believe God, and if we believe his truth, we will know that everything that he has said that will happen is happening and will continue to happen. And we just need to trust God and his inspired word. So let's get into this dream. I want to know. I, I'm curious now that I've heard read the story. I want to know what is the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. So in verse 31, now Daniel is ready to tell Nebuchadnezzar the dream. Now Daniel is ready to tell Nebuchadnezzar the vision that he had. And I think it's just so amazing that Nebuchadnezzar, who forgot his dream, somebody else was able to tell him his dream. We should praise God that God has the power to reach into the vast of our mind and to understand the truth of our thoughts. But we should also praise God because we know if God knew what Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed, it must have been a dream that came from God. And so Daniel begins to prophesy. He begins to tell him what he saw. He says, oh, king, you saw a great image. You saw this great statue, this, this beautiful, bright image. He says, it was, it was excellent. It stood before you. He said its form was terrible, not in the sense, not in a scary sense of terrible, not in an awful sense of terrible, but it was, it was, it, it was amazing. It was terribly amazing. It was terribly interesting and intriguing. He says, you saw this great image that had a head that was made of gold. It had chest and arms that was made of silver. The belly and thighs were made of brass. Then the legs were made of iron. Then the feet were made of a mixture of iron and clay. Now, usually when you see a statue, you, you see something that is made from one image. You see a statue that's made from gold. You see a statue that's made from clay or a statue that's made from iron. But here it is. Ne Daniel is telling Nebuchadnezzar, you saw a statue that had five different elements in it. Gold, silver, brass, iron, and then iron and clay. Some artists have tried to uh, depict this picture. Some artists have tried to draw what Nebuchadnezzar saw. We don't really know exactly what it looked like, but some would say it looked something 
like this. And if you would direct yourself to the screen, maybe it looks something like this. Uh, as you can see, you notice that the head is, 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 is a gold figure. The, the chest and arms are made of silver. There it is, that belly where the skirt begins and, and the thighs where the skirt ends. It is made out of brass and then iron. And then at the bottom, you can see this weird faded image of iron and clay. It's a very interesting, it's a very intriguing image. But then Daniel goes on to say, you see this image, it's standing tall, it's in stature. And in verse 34, you saw it until a stone was cut out and was thrown at the image, at its feet, and destroyed it completely. The iron, the clay, the gold, the silver, everything was broken. And then that stone that broke the image, it turned into a great mountain and then it filled the old world. So what is this? What, what is this representing? And in verse 36, Daniel gets into it. He says, let me tell you now the interpretation. In verse 37, he says, oh king, you are a king of kings. God has given you power. And everywhere you go, the children of men, they look at you, they, they're amazed. They, the beasts of the field, they, he has given to you. He says, he has made you ruler over everything. He's talking to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is king of Babylon. And he says, you are that head of gold. Now, you can't be a king if you don't have a kingdom. So God is telling Nebuchadnezzar, you are king over everything because you have a kingdom, and that kingdom is Babylon. In other words, that head of gold represents a kingdom. It represents a nation that is the nation called Babylon. Babylon is the head of gold. But after Babylon, Daniel goes on to say, he says, but after you, another kingdom will come up. It will destroy your kingdom, and it will be weaker than you, inferior than you, but it will rise up and it will rule over all the earth. And when we look in history, we recognize that the kingdom that came after Babylon was the kingdom that we call Persia, but it was a mixture between Persia and another kingdom called the Medes, and so we call it Medo-Persia. The, the silver would represent this kingdom called Medo-Persia. We keep going forward, and he says, another kingdom will come up. And this kingdom will, of course, be inferior to the second kingdom, but this kingdom will rule over the world. And the kingdom that conquered Medo-Persia and destroyed it, and the world ruler was known as Greece. The belly and thighs, the brass, represents Greece. Then he says, there's another kingdom that's going to come up after that kingdom, and that kingdom conquered Greece, and this is known as the kingdom of Rome. But then in verse 40, he talks about that fourth kingdom, the Roman kingdom, and he says, this kingdom will be strong as iron, but in, in I'm sorry, in verse 42, he says, this kingdom, however, verse 41, I'm sorry, this kingdom, however, will not be destroyed, but it will be divided. It will split up. It, it, it won't exist the same way that it did. And of course, we know that after the Roman Empire fell, it split up into 10 sub-kingdoms, 10 sub-nations, which went on to become the nations that we know today of Western Europe. Here we are. We have these four kingdoms and then the kingdoms of Western Europe. And as Daniel is looking at this, he's living in the time of Babylon. Kingdom won't last forever. After that, and another after that, your kingdom will not last forever. There are lots of lessons that we can learn from this. And as we go on throughout the next eight days, we're going to continue, or seven days rather, we're going to continue to talk about these things. And we're going to get dig deeper and deeper into Daniel 2 from different perspectives and different lenses. But I think that there are three things that we can primarily learn from this prophecy given to us in Daniel chapter 2. And sure, we have this list of, list of kingdoms. Sure, we have this list of nations. But what does it mean? What is the significance? What can we learn? 
from Daniel chapter 2. And I think the first thing that we can learn from Daniel chapter 2 is that is the fact that God is still in control. When we look in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 37, we notice that the Bible says to Nebuchadnezzar, you, O king, are a king of kings. Daniel is affirming Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And he says to Nebuchadnezzar, I want you to understand, though, God, the God of heaven has given you a kingdom. In other words, the only reason Nebuchadnezzar was still strong and powerful is because the God of heaven allowed him to be so. In other words, no matter what may take place in the world today, the government does not have the final say. But it is God, Jesus Christ, as we sing the song, he's got the whole world in his hands. He is the true ruler of this planet. And in fact, sometimes we can get so overwhelmed in political issues and political problems that we forget who is really in charge. It's not the United States government. It's not the Philippines. It's not Brazil. It's not China. Uh, neither is it uh, the papacy itself. But God is still in control of this world. This is still his planet. And we ought to believe that and trust in divine power that God is still king of kings and Lord of Lords. But when we think about this God being in control, we, 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 we need to go back and look at these, this, this image again and look at these nations again, because we, we look at Babylon, we look at Medo-Persia, we look at Greece, Rome, and Western Europe, and we make an observation. And in fact, there's a word that I'd like to teach you if you want to write it down and look it up. The word is hegemony, H-E-G-E-M-O-N-Y, hegemony. The word hegemony comes from the word hegemon, which hegemon means a global superpower. A hegemon is the, the kingpin of the world. It's the leader of the world. It's the leading force. And in fact, today, there's big debate on who is the global superpower, who's the hegemon of the world amongst political circles. When we look at these kingdoms, we notice that there's a reason why God chose them. The reason was, is because these kingdoms represented the global hegemon or the global superpower of their day. Babylon was the superpower of its day. There was not a kingdom greater than Babylon. The same for Persia, the same for Greece, the same for Rome. And then some may ask, well, what about Western Europe? How is Western Europe the superpower of its day? Don't, there, there, there's something that we need to understand about history, and that is that uh, if you look this up on YouTube, you look up the concept of colonization, you'll find videos that show you there is not or very few countries on this planet that have not been colonized by a European country. Which means Europe, Western Europe, has its foothold on the world today. Not a single country has not been influenced by European culture. We call this westernization. We also call this uh, colonization. And when we think of Western Europe and the United States combined, we understand that uh, there is this concept that we come up with called Western culture. And through the United States and Western Europe combined, Western culture dominates the world more than any other force, which is to say Western Europe or Western culture is the global hegemon. But just because there are these global powers in place that does not limit the power of God. In fact, when we relate it to the situation that's taking place right now, coronavirus, we can get frustrated with what the government may do or frustrated with what the powers that be may do, but we must understand in this crisis, God is in control and we ought trust in God and not in man. So we keep reading, we keep talking, and we keep looking at this. Number one, we must remember that God is still in control. Number two, God will not allow suffering to last forever. Now, someone may say, Chase, how did you get that <laughs> from this dream? Well, when you read Daniel chapter two, you discover that those four kingdoms, not only were they global powers, not only were they uh, global superpowers, but they were... Uh, oppressive powers. Babylon was responsible for oppressing God's people. 
uh, Medo-Persia was responsible for oppressing God's people. The same with Greece, the same with Rome. Even Western Europe today is in, and in history has been responsible for oppressive forces. I mean, we think of things such as the slave trade and we think of things such as the Holocaust. These are all forms of oppression that took place through Western European powers. And so these nations, these kingdoms are oppressive powers. But despite the oppression that takes place in the world, God will not sit and allow it to last forever. In fact, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33, we read that God has no pleasure in the death of him that dieth. He does not like to see his people suffering. He does not like to see the pain that we're going through. So we must trust God and believe trouble will not last always. In fact, we read in the book of Revelation that soon and very soon, there will be a day where there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more dying. Trouble won't last always, and God will not always allow his people to suffer. And in the context of what is taking place today with coronavirus, with many individuals dying, with, with, with uh, wars and so on and so forth taking place on, in this world today, God will not allow it to last forever. And we can be sure of that and we can trust him because he has promised us that in his word. Now there's another lesson. There is another lesson that we can learn from this. And of course, we're going to dig deeper as the week, as the week goes on because there are so many things that we can pull from this lesson. Well, we discovered that, of course, the head of gold represented Babylon. We discovered that the, 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 the silver represented Medo-Persia. And I want to put it in context with this suffering before I get into the last point. First, I want to put it in context because Babylon in particular was responsible for oppressing God's people. Babylon put uh, the Jews in captivity. Medo-Persia is responsible for oppressing God's people. Daniel was thrown in the lion's den by the Medo-Persian Empire. Greece is responsible for the same thing. Roman, uh, the Roman Empire responsible for the same thing. And so it is, the Western European Empire will be responsible for the same thing. In fact, we'll talk about this more as the week goes on. But when you read uh, verse 42, it says that the the, the toes were made of part iron and part clay. This is this weird mixture. It doesn't make sense. It's a mixture that is odd. It's a mixture that shouldn't take place. No one mixes iron and clay and expects to make a good pot. Why does God use this imagery? It's because European powers has for so long, and we find this in history. When you study prophecy, you have to study history as well. We find that so long European powers has made an odd mixture in government. That mixture is the mixture of church and state. This mixture is not a mixture that should take place. It's an odd mixture. It is not a productive mixture. It doesn't work well, but they nevertheless try to do it. Church and state. And as we study, as we continue to study, we'll discover that the church and the state joined together will be responsible for the persecution and the oppression of God's people. But are we to worry about this? Are we to be afraid about this? Are we to, to be scared about what may take place in the world today? No. Rather, we should look forward to what comes next. And this brings me to my third point. God will, and I made a typo there, but it should say, God will save his people. God will save his people. No matter what may take place in the world, God will save his people. When we read in verse, verse uh, 44, it says, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. In other words, uh, the kingdoms of this world will not always last forever. We, and in fact, we go back to that, to that um, old dream that Nebuchadnezzar had that we mentioned earlier, and we noticed that at the end of the dream, a stone hit the image. 
destroying all of the all of the kingdoms that existed throughout history. It destroyed all of the influences and all of the oppressive powers and all of the governments made by man, sinful governments that existed. And the stone hit it and destroyed it. And here it is, Daniel says, at the time that that stone destroys every kingdom, God will set up his own kingdom. This kingdom will not be a kingdom that is run by man. It will not be a kingdom that is governed by sinful beings, but it will be a kingdom that is controlled and ruled by God. Christ is the king of this kingdom. Jesus Christ, the king of this, king, the king of this kingdom, is preparing a place for us right now to be a part of that kingdom. And the Bible says in verse 44 that this kingdom will stand forever. In other words, the Bible is saying that there will not always be a United States of America. The Bible is saying there won't always be a, a Germany or, or, or Rome. There won't always be a Philippines. There won't always be a Brazil or, or an Egypt. These kingdoms will not last forever. But there is one kingdom that will, and that is the kingdom of God. And because the kingdom of God is the kingdom that will last forever, right now, in these last days, especially in the times that we are living in, as we see everything taking place, we should be making preparations to be a part of that kingdom. We should be preparing to get into that kingdom. You know, uh, it reminds me of a text that's found in the book of Hebrews. In fact, if you have Hebrews with you, and of course, we haven't gotten, we, we've only scratched the surface today. We haven't gotten really deep into these things, but we'll get deeper as we go along. But if you find Hebrews, you'll discover that, or I'm sorry, Romans, you'll discover that in that faith chapter, in the book of Romans, that the author of Romans speaks of those individuals who were looking for I'm sorry, I said Hebrews. It was Hebrews 11. I, you forgive me. But they were looking for this promise. By faith, they lived. And Paul goes on to say in the text that, that these, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13, that these individuals in history all died in faith. They did not receive the promise. What is the promise that they were supposed to receive? The promise that we've been studying this entire hour, which is the promise of the kingdom of God. That's the promise. It says they died without receiving the promise. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13. But they saw it afar off. They believed in the promise and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. Then it says in verse 14, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And if they had truly been mindful of this country from where they came out, they would have had the opportunity to go back. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly country. The kingdom that we are looking for, the, the nation that we are looking for, the country that we are waiting for God to set up is not a country of this world, but it's a heavenly one. It's that heavenly city, that new Jerusalem. In fact, we want to be citizens of that country. I'm told that when an individual tries to apply for citizenship on countries, it can take days, it can take weeks, sometimes even years for that to go through. You have to fill out a form and you have to take tests and take classes to become a citizen of the United States or some other country. But I'm so glad that in the kingdom of God, you don't have to take a class to be a citizen. <laughs> you don't have to sign a form to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. In fact, the Bible says in John 3, 16, that those who will inherit eternal life, all they need is faith. And then John goes on to say, or Jesus goes on to say in John chapter 3, that, that, that in order for someone to see the kingdom of God, they must be born again. You know, the best way to become a citizen of the country is to be born in that country. And in order to be a citizen of the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. You have to surrender your life to Christ. 
You have to give your life to Jesus and let him fill you with the Holy Spirit and accept him by faith. You have to study his word and pray and ask him to, to, to be with you and to change your character. You have to be born again. And so as we read Daniel, as we read Daniel, we read about all these kingdoms. These kingdoms all will do different things. These kingdoms are very complicated in their nature, but one thing we can be reminded of and that is pertinent about these kingdoms and that they all have in common is that they're all earthly kingdoms. They're all sinful kingdoms. They're all run by men. But Jesus says there's another kingdom. It's not run by man, but it's run by him. He's not sinful. In these kingdoms, there's hate, but in his kingdom, there's love. In this kingdom, there's war and crime and, 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 and craziness, but in his kingdom, in these kingdoms, that is, but in his kingdom, there's peace. In this kingdom, there's sadness and depression, but in his kingdom, there's joy. In this kingdom, in these kingdoms of this world, there's death and there's sickness and disease, but in his kingdom, there's everlasting life. And so tonight, tonight, what we want to do is make the decision to be a part of his kingdom. As the week goes on, we'll continue to study, as I mentioned so many times. We'll continue to dig deeper because God has something he wants us to know. Brothers and sisters, the world in which we live in is coming to a close. Did you notice that the time that the stone or the time that the kingdom of God is set up, according to Daniel 2, is at the time of those 10 kingdoms in Western Europe. In other words, we're living in that time. And pretty soon Jesus is getting ready to come to set up his kingdom. And so the purpose of this series that we're starting is to prepare us for that kingdom. Tonight, Tonight, however, let's just make the decision to be a part of it. Tonight, let's just make the decision to say, I want to be in that kingdom tonight. So if that's your desire, you can, if the chat is there, you can drop a amen in the chat. You can send us a hallelujah or amen and say, look, I want to be a part of that kingdom. Put a thumbs up, clap your hands as you see on the screen thumbs up and say i want to be a part of that kingdom tomorrow night we're going to finish this series or we're going to continue this series rather and we want you to come tomorrow night because pastor Choi has a very special message for us a message that's pertinent for this time it's entitled coronavirus uh, disasters and the end of the world as all these things are taking place, we have many questions. We want to know, is this the end? What's going on? What's taking place? Well, tonight we've discovered that Jesus is coming soon. So whatever does happen, we have this to look forward to. But tomorrow night, we're going to find some more clarity on what, taking, what is taking place in the world today. So we hope to see you tomorrow night. But tonight I ask that everyone, wherever you are in your house, whatever you're doing, that you just bow your head with me and close your eyes. And if it's your desire to be a part of that kingdom, that you just pray with me. This meeting is coming to a close. We didn't keep you long. We don't want to keep you long every night. <laughs> we want you to continue to come. But we're coming to a close right now. So we ask that you just close your eyes and pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that the kingdoms of this world will fall. We thank you so much that the trouble and the oppression and the suffering that we go through in this world will not always last, but that there's a kingdom coming soon. And that kingdom will reign as the one world superpower. And that's nothing to be afraid of. That's something to be glad about because it's a kingdom of perfection. And we want to be citizens of that kingdom. And the reason the individuals have come to this series now is because they want to be citizens of that kingdom. And so, Lord, I ask that you would help us. Help us to study, help us to understand everything we're going to talk about for the next week so that we can be ready when you come. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we leave, before we close, we want to ask that you 
come back tomorrow night, but not only that, invite someone else to sign up and to join us. These truths are so pertinent, these truths are so beautiful. It's not enough for us to just sit on all by ourselves. So if it's your desire to, to, to be a witness to somebody, to bring them, invite somebody, send them the information for this. And I'll hand it over to Pastor Choi, who will yes. close up for the evening. Thank you, Chase. I, I trust that you've all learned something and benefited from today's presentation. I know I did. Uh, the chat room is available for you to send in your questions. Uh, so I'm going to give, since we have some time, I'm going to give uh, everyone that's a participant in this room to uh, send in a question that you may have. Uh, I believe you just hit the message. Uh, uh, there's a little link that says mes message on top. If you click on that, you should open the chat box and you can type in whatever question you may have that you'd like to have addressed in the next meeting that we're going to have tomorrow and so tomorrow we're going to be meeting at seven o'clock again and i'll be going over the message tomorrow dealing with the coronavirus and disasters and the end of the world and so this is very pertinent to what we're going through right now uh, there's a lot of questions about where are we headed uh, due, due to this corona crisis and what can we expect to happen next and the bible has it all laid out and you could, you're not going to be caught uh, unexpected or by surprise if you allow the Word of God to prepare us, as Chase said. And so uh, we thank you all for joining us. Uh, go ahead and feel, feel free to put those questions in. Also, if you want to uh, message me privately, uh, if you want to give me your mailing address to get that Daniel and Revelation magazine, that's our free offer that we're offering during the duration of this series. Uh, if you'd like to take us up on that offer, uh, just send us your uh, e send us an email with your mailing address. Our email is biblevision777 at gmail.com. Very easy to remember. Biblevision777 at gmail.com. Just shoot me an email there with your mailing address, and we'll be happy to send that off to you as soon as we can. Uh, but we thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we are glad to see you here. I, I'm glad that uh, we have Larry, Lori, uh, Moto, E6, Riaz, Roger, uh, Sherry, Scott, Thomas, and Johan. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, God bless you. We hope that you will join us again tomorrow and also bring other people uh, to come as well. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we won't keep you any longer. Uh, have a good night, and we hope to see you. Well, we'll be sure to see you tomorrow at seven o'clock. God bless you and bring those questions in if you have any. Have a good night.